Now, please join me in welcoming our next panel, The Formative Years. It is my pleasure to introduce Christine Cunningham, Director of the Museum of Sciences Engineering is Elementary, Aya Badir, Founder of Little Bits, Suzanne Harper, Senior Director of National STEM Strategy at Girl Scouts of the USA, and renowned children's author, Andrea Bidet. I'd also like to welcome back Allison Stewart to lead this conversation. So Allison, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. The floor is actually going to be theirs. Um, I'm going to leave a lot of time for Q&A because this is such a, a superstar panel. Um, so everybody get your questions ready. Uh, I do want to sort of set a baseline and I'm going to ask each of you to tell us a little bit about your history and then how it brought you to the place where you decided this is how I'm going to make a contribution to STEM and how I'm going to engage STEM in my career and in my passion. Let's we'll start with you. Um, I actually have a background in science and in biology and computer science and I was the uh, IT person at the other end of the phone for years, you know, the did you turn it off and turn it back on person. <laughs> um, and then when I had kids I stopped working and I started reading tons of children's books and um, ended up writing some and they sort of took off and it just happens that some of them happen to be about a girl who's an engineer and a girl who's a scientist and a boy who's a, an architect. Um, so even though my background was in STEM, the, the, the approach I take is really about storytelling mm -hmm. and trying to connect to kids at uh, a really personal level. So I don't even think really of these books as being about engineering or science, but about being about perseverance and curiosity because every kid has those traits. And I think if we can approach helping girls particularly, but um, all kids, look at it sort of as, a, as an, a human endeavor. Mm -hmm. I, like, they'll think, well, I'm curious. Maybe I can do that. Maybe I can try this experiment. Maybe I can go out and try making things. Um, so really taking it from a personal storytelling approach, which we know girls particularly respond to mm -hmm. storytelling. So I mean, boys do too, but it's, that's a really interesting doorway to take into these worlds, the STEM world. Suzanne. Sure. Uh, most of my background has been in publishing, both magazine publishing and, and writing books for children and, and young adults as well. I was at Disney Adventures Magazine for many years, which is a magazine for tweens. That background in writing for children and teenagers actually led me to Girl Scouts in the program team and, and working there. And I have always been interested in STEM. I developed a great appreciation and love for STEM activities and STEM education at Girl Scouts. Two years ago, we decided to create, as an organization, a national STEM initiative, and I was asked if I was interested, and of course I said yes. Um, and I love the job, because not only are we creating program for girls that will interest them in STEM, but every day I get to watch the future being invented. That's the way I feel, as I read all the articles on STEM every single day. Daya? Um, I think I was always interested in STEM. Mm -hmm. I can't remember a time where I wasn't. I was always a tinkerer kid. I was breaking things apart and I was uh, sometimes trying to put things back together. <laughs> um, but um, I, I attribute it to uh, really kind of the environment I grew up in. My parents um, would get us electricity sets and chemistry kits. Uh, since we were very young and would encourage us to break things open. We wouldn't get in trouble when we did. I have three sisters and all of us are in the STEM field um, one way or another and we grew up in Beirut in Lebanon. So um, it, it really inspired me kind of on my trajectory. I went, I did engineering, I went to, I did uh, computer engineering, then I went to MIT to do um, uh, a master's at the Media Lab um, and kind of reconnected with my roots of how I grew up uh, with chemistry sets and electricity kits and ended up starting a company making uh, electronic kits to inspire kids, uh, girls in particular, to become uh, inventors, engineers, and get excited about STEM. My first love uh, was actually teaching. So I went to kindergarten and came home and taught my three younger siblings basically every day since then. Um, so <laughs> they were all reading before they entered into kindergarten. But I was also raised by, um, my mother was a science and math person in the days when there weren't a whole lot of science and math majors. Um, and so I grew up, of course, girls do science. So my second love was science. And in middle school, I started to watch my female friends leaving science. And I thought this was just 
perplexing to me. Why would you leave something, especially if you were good at it? Um, so when I was thinking about what to do, I always knew I was going to teach eventually, in some way, shape, or form, but I got an undergraduate um, bachelor's and master's degree in science um, and watched, again, girls, women leaving um, for no reasons that had to do anything with their abilities. So I started to think about how do we help people who are underrepresented, underserved, and also underperforming um, in science and engineering, how do we keep them? It's, it's not, there's nothing wrong with them, there's something wrong with the way that we're presenting it and teaching it. Um, and so that launched me into um, a PhD program in education, science education, with a real focus on sort of how do you use education and particularly STEM as a, so, a tool for social justice. So I did a lot of reading about the features of STEM and um, science and engineering that tend to drive girls and women out, and on the other hand, the kinds of things they're attracted to. Um, and when I started to move into engineering from science, I realized there are facets and features of engineering that can re-engage students who have not traditionally um, been interested in or who have been driven out of uh, science and engineering. And decided that it was time to bring engineering down from just being a collegiate or high school endeavor to younger grades. We have to get them before they've been socialized that they can't do it. So if you have them doing it and you call it engineering, then they start to do it. And so I founded Engineering as Elementary about 14 years ago. You which said was, that should, you should introduce engineering before they can spell it. Before they spell it, yep. They, should, they can do engineering before they can spell it. We're not, I like to say we're natural engineers. If you watch any three-year-old at play, they build sandcastles, they build forts, they build doll's beds, they build them, they knock them down. Um, that we naturally solve problems in human beings, and traditionally, we've educated that out of kids. And they go to school, they're told there's a right answer and there's a way to do it. Um, and so my real question was, how do you take this natural process that people do and get it into schools and foster creativity and innovation throughout their career so that we equip them with a, a set of habits of mind that prepare them for whatever future they have. Some of them may go into STEM, some of them may do something different, but can we foster these um, problem solving processes and innovative sort of ideas of kids, all kids, and so making sure that anything we create rests on, we have 14 inclusive design principles for all of our curricula, um, and we make sure that we start thinking about this diverse audience and how do you design for the inclusion of everyone with the hope that um, you can foster abilities and skills that go sort of lifelong. If you get them when they're young um, and they do engineering and they'll walk, we have little four and five year olds walking around singing songs about engineering, doing engineering, saying I'm an engineer. Um, it's harder, not impossible, but harder for someone to come and say, you know, you don't belong in engineering when they've had that really positive experience. This brings me to you and bringing engineering to play. Show folks what little, what little bits. I'm going to show you. They're so cool. Sure. So um, Little Bits is a system of electronic building blocks. Uh, we are very inspired by Lego, but rather than um, the building blocks being plastic and pile on top of each other to make buildings and bridges that are static, we make electronics. So each building block is a circuit, it's pre-assembled, pre-engineered, and they snap with magnets so that you can make a circuit immediately. Um, and it's color coded, so blue is power, pink is input, green is output, and very quickly you can start to make um, uh, circuits that are pressure sensitive, that are responding to sensors, that are, um, you can make sound and you can make complex mechanics. This is one of our newest uh, bits that we made that's a partnership with a large franchise that I will not name, but um, <laughs> da -na 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 -na. <laughs> maybe you recognize it. I'll do it again, it. I'm sorry, I sang. So um, the idea I is that. I did that again, I, I uh, yeah. sang over here. There. Yeah. Never gets old, yeah. That, so, um, Never. I just carry it around and just do it for people to, to, to start conversation, yeah. Um, no, the idea is that, um, you know, in, when, when, um, when Lego started, mm -hmm. the world was made of buildings and bridges. And the way you allowed kids to participate in that world and imagine that world um, and uh, be, be become prepared for the world that they were coming out uh, of school for uh, is you would give them these, these static uh, building blocks. The world has changed now. The world is all, it's interactive, it's algorithmic, everything is responsive to something else. Um, kids have to be technology savvy. It's a matter of literacy. Mm -hmm. It's no longer okay to not 
understand it. And so we equip them with a building block that is capturing technology, lights, sound, sensors, motors, um, you know, programmable, Wi-Fi, cloud, uh, Bluetooth, all the things that they see around them that they take for granted, that they use and are savvy with from a consumption perspective, we give them the tools to create with. And so um, the uh, company is, has been around for about uh, six years. Uh, we're at about 20,000 schools. We're in about 60 countries. Uh, we uh, mostly focus on ages eight and up. Um, and so eight to 12 is really the sweet spot, but um, in schools we see it used in a science class and math class, but also in arts and crafts, in design thinking, in entrepreneurship, um, in, um, in, in grammar, in all sorts of things. And we really kind of try to employ, you know, STEAM principles and really try to uh, uh, infiltrate mm -hmm. every aspect of, of education and of play. I'm interested in the development, when you're in the development process, did you have discussions, or what were the discussions around whether to make these gender neutral or not? Because there are toys like Goldie Blocks, which is an arc, a sort of an engineering set specifically geared towards young girls who didn't have those kind of toys and tools. They were stuck in the pink aisle, didn't have that. Um, what were those conversations? Because to me, it seems like it is a gender neutral toy. Um, well, first of all, at the beginning, it was just me, so it was my <laughs> conversations with myself, which is... Um, Those are sometimes the best. Which is, Good yeah, things come out exactly. As long as you always win, though. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, I, uh, one of my missions was always to get more girls into, um, into STEM, but I uh, disagree with the uh, strategy of making it... Uh, making gendered products. I never wanted to be a girly girl and I never thought of myself as any different than any boys that were around and so uh, I didn't want to uh, kind of perpetuate this idea of like girls play alone, boys play alone. We had to create something that was really about girls and boys together, about different ages together, about parents and kids together uh, and tech savvy and non-tech savvy together. So. Um, a little bit from day zero was gender neutral. And the way uh, we make it gender neutral is that, um, you know, you notice the, the circuits are white. They're not the traditional black or green because we wanted to break out of the stigma associated with electronics. The, the connectors are candy colored, they're neon. So they're pink, but they're also green and blue and they're really kind of, they feel like playful candy. Um, we, uh, we deliberately in our marketing showcase a lot of girls um, we, uh, we showcase inventions that are not just vehicles and shooting games. We show uh, bubble blowers and, uh, and Ferris wheels and, uh, and you know, robotic pets and all sorts of things that really span across uh, girls and boys. As a result, 40% of our uh, uh, um, community in kids is girls. Mm. So it works. Um, when you really break down the, the boundary early on um, and you create these gender neutral experiences, um, it actually works. The Girl Scout badges yes. have expanded yes. in a big way. Yes. You can get a cybersecurity badge now. Well, we're working, working on, on those. They're coming yeah. out yeah, next, they're coming year. next year. Yes. 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 Tell me a little bit more about the kinds of STEM badges and the encouragement of girls to think about this. Because, I mean, we, when I was a Girl Scout mm -hmm. a million and a half years ago, mm -hmm. you, it, was, it was cooking and campfire and sit-upons. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now you've, you've decided to meet them where they live. Absolutely. Um, it's a way of keeping Girl Scouts relevant, although, of course, camping will always be relevant <laughs> to, to girls and to people in general. But we're very excited about what we're doing. We started a new national STEM initiative about two years ago, and this fall we've launched for K-5 through girls a series called Think Like an Engineer, where they learn design thinking, Think Like a Programmer, to learn how programmers think computational thinking, and Think Like a Citizen Scientist, Girls earn awards that have those titles, and then they can also do robotics badges, they can also do mechanical engineering badges, and as you said, cybersecurity will be mm -hmm. coming next year. So, and we're going to be doing the same thing for the older girls as well. And it really is important to your point that girls are growing up in a world that is very technological, it is about learning how to, how computers work and all that, and it's also tapping into what girls really want. They love to invent. They love to make things. And they actually are very interested in being entrepreneurs. I've heard that come up a few times already on this panel. So we're hoping to pull all of that together to help girls do what, to achieve the, the ambitions and the dreams that they have. What are your challenges in doing that? Well, one of the challenges is, frankly, kind of our scale, because we have almost 2 million girls. 
And um, it's actually a challenge and a, and a nice thing to have because we know that girls and kids in general develop their STEM identity around second or third grade. They either say, you know what, STEM is fun, I can do it, I might like it, or they decide it's not for me. And if they decide that in second or third grade, it's really hard to get them back in middle school or high school. The great news is that the second and third graders, the Girl Scout Brownies, are our largest demographic. So we're able to reach 800,000 girls just in that age group. So the scale is great. I think it's really about getting the program out to girls and to support our volunteers. We have 800,000 volunteers. We need to support them in terms of delivering it. And we really need to attract more STEM professionals who want to lend a hand, which doesn't mean that you have to be a troop leader that meets every other week in a church basement, right? But to come to a council event, a Girl Scout council event, and work with girls, or to come to one troop meeting. It's so much, um, it has so much impact for girls when women who are STEM professionals come and talk to them. Some girls have, we've had programs, we had one program on food science, and a food scientist came and talked about, oh, I invent ice cream flavors. <coughs> and there was a girl who was so intrigued, she kept stalking her. She was following her to the parking lot <laughs> saying, tell me more about this, right? So girls don't even know what they don't know, and we can introduce that to them. Something you said, which is interesting, is that or they decide they're science people or not. Mm -hmm. But we all know sort of the world helps them decide whether mm -hmm. they're science people or not. And that mm -hmm. goes to, I think, the first page in, in Rosie Revere, Engineer. It says, this is the story of Rosie Revere, who dreamed of becoming a great engineer. In Lila Greer's classroom at Blue River Creek, young Rosie sat shyly, not daring to speak. And you see her sort of not sure she wants to speak up. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how you think we can combat those outside influences that push people to decide one way or the other, especially young girls. Well, I think that what you said a moment ago is so on target, where girls are, are now at second, third grade deciding their STEM identity. Um, recently, about, I don't know, three or four months ago, there was a study that showed that girls, six and seven year olds, already start thinking that boys are better at STEM than they are. That suggests to me that we are starting way, way, way too late and that we have to really start from the get-go so that this being comfortable with ideas of exploration and curiosity and STEM um, really just become part of the girls' DNA so that when they get into school, it's, they're going to really hit the ground running when they get to join you know, these marvelous programs and, and then start working with things like Little Bits. Just that, that's so important. So I, I've been thinking about why doesn't that already happen? And it seems to me, when you talk really young kids, they have access to media, being books and TV, but they always have gatekeepers. And those gatekeepers are their parents, their grandparents, daycare people, uh, and eventually maybe preschool teachers. So I think that the matter, the level of comfort that those gatekeepers have mm -hmm. with STEM will determine early on how much exposure and what kind of exposure these kids will have, be that, you know, doing things like, like your parents might have done where you're getting there doing hands-on things at home or getting into programs or finding books like mine and so many others. There are lots and lots of great books. But I think the reason that's not happening is something seriously fundamental about the way we think about science. We think about science as finding answers. And science is about asking questions. So imagine a girl coming up to her mom or whoever and says, Mom, why is the sky blue? And the mom, if she's very comfortable with science, will sort of take it and run with it. But if she's not, she might be, oh, I forgot that day in sixth grade. I don't remember the answer. Well, suddenly now it's this sort of frustrating moment for both of them. But what if we change that and we change and find ways to help people think of science as questioning? And when that girl comes up and says, Mom, why is the sky blue? The mom says, I don't know. Let's figure it out. And then the girl says, well, how do we do that? And the mom says, I don't know. Let's figure it out. <laughs> and then that starts suddenly this dialogue, and it starts this process. And imagine the power of that, where now instead of a frustrated parent and a frustrated kid, you have two scientists, two scientists on a quest to figure things out. How empowering is that? How incredibly wondrous 
to have a kid on the same footing as their adult in a process of exploration. And so, of course, the next step then is to find who are the allies out there. Who are the people who know these answers or know the questions to take them through the process? Um, and the natural next stop is, of course, the library, where you can do that step of scientific exploration and find out what people have already found out and also learn how to find things out. Um, I think that the libraries in this country are, are greatly underused and mm -hmm. librarians are on this. Mm -hmm. School librarians are yeah. on this. I mean, they are up for this challenge and they are starting you know, maker spaces. They are really in the game of helping kids and hopefully families, you know, and certainly once they get to school um, to really be connected and to help figure this out. Let's get some microphones out and, uh, um, oh, look, let's go. Oh, they're ready to go. Let's do it right here. <laughs> I had another question, but. Um, my name is Jessica Polito. I'm at Wellesley College, where, among other things, I work with our elementary education program in math. And that's my concern that the overwhelming majority of our elementary teachers are women, and many of them, I think, would say most are really not themselves deeply comfortable with math and STEM. And I certainly believe, and there's research that supports it, that they, even with the best of intentions, they pass some of that attitude on to their students and particularly their girls who see them as role models because they are women. So I suppose I'm asking, what way do we have to get this huge number of elementary educators involved in not just a conversation that it's important, but the attitude change in the learning for themselves. Christine, that sounds like it might be your wheelhouse. Um, so this is a challenge that we faced a lot, especially when you throw not only the word math, but engineering, which was completely unheard of at elementary level when we started. We actually had to slide it in, in the early years as design, because they wouldn't show up if it said engineering. Um, but what we've seen <laughs> from teachers is once you can get them engaged in it, um, they think about what they're capable of doing and what their students are capable of doing differently. So we like to say that the students actually drive the teachers to think about the capabilities of both the students as a whole and the student as an individual differently. Um, because if you're doing it and you're sort of shaking up the norms in ways that are outside of traditional ways of teaching, they're not doing worksheets, they're not looking for the right answer, you're giving an open-ended problem to which a multiplicity of answers arise, you sort of disrupt the norm and then they have to think about themselves and their students differently. And one of the most you know, gratifying um, things that we hear from the field, I think with our project, is teachers saying, I never thought that fill in the blank, some child who hasn't done traditionally well in school or from a population that hasn't, could be such a great engineer. Or everyone in the class recognizing students have different kinds of talents and the students themselves sort of coming to that realization because that's the learning moment where you're transforming how teachers think about the abilities of their kids and kids think about the abilities of themselves. And I think you have to shake it up a little bit in order for things to settle differently. Could I add too that adding a, an element of um, something they are very comfortable with, which is literacy, and driving the engineering process or, or the discovery through substem mm -hmm. through books uh, is an incredibly powerful way to do it. There's a marvelous series published by the National Science Teachers Association called Picture Perfect STEM. Mm -hmm. And the idea is they take picture books and like of any variety, and then they pair those with different um, science projects, engineering projects, and they're fantastic. So it's a way to sort of ease into that, but it also really connects again with girls and all kids, but girls who are particularly you know, interested in, in narrative. Um, so that, that's fantastic. Also, I think there is just, it's a really, really rich time right now for books. And I think helping educators be aware of what's out there. One resource that I go to all the time is amightygirl.com. Is I think for any student, one of, well, for any kid, one of the best curated sites of what's new in kids' books, uh, but a particular focus towards girls, but fantastic resource for that. And can I also mention one more thing? Just yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. To, go ahead. Just, just Mike, leading on what you were saying oh, about say, yeah. reaching I'm people the where they're comfortable. <laughs> we have the same issue actually. Sometimes with Girl Scout volunteers, yeah. um, they don't have teaching degrees either. Most of them, or maybe are not comfortable with STEM. But we find that 
When we do activities that feel familiar, it's very, very helpful. So for example, we were working with Code.org on our Think Like a Programmer series. And they chose and suggested one activity that I absolutely loved because it was making a sun catcher, which is a craft. And every girl gets to go home with a sun catcher, and that's just awesome in Girl Scout world. But you're learning <laughs> algorithms, variables, and functions by doing that. Uh, it's also very helpful to have, they also had a video with someone talking about how you teach the algorithms and functions and variables using the sun catcher. So that was really helpful. And then the other thing was sometimes having a professional come in and talk about the reality of what it's like to work in an engineering field, for example, is helpful. When we piloted our engineering series, one of the volunteers said, what was so great was we had a member of the Society of Women Engineers come to one of our meetings and she told us, when you try something, if you invent something and you prototype something and you try it, you will either succeed or you will learn something. It is not oh, failure. And she said, that's our mantra now. And I love that, that her girls are taking that forward with everything that they're doing. Any other question here? Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Paul Paravano. I'm from MIT, do government relations there. And I wanted to add another observation to um, this wealth of information that you all are uh, giving us. Um, about six years ago, a computer science professor at MIT started a class called Principles and Practice in Assistive Technology. I was, of course, fascinated by this because I benefit so much from assistive technology. And for those six years, the class has been oversubscribed, and it is the only class at MIT taught in the School of Engineering that has more women in it than men. Mm. And I wonder if that tells us something about what motivates young women to think about continuing their careers in engineering, because at MIT, we're blessed with half the freshman class who are already talented and gifted in science and technology. But this is a way that perhaps these young women are thinking about how they can make a better world, help other people, and think about developing economic models and companies, startup companies, that can assist people in a variety of ways. I wonder if any of the panelists have a comment on that. We actually had that this conversation. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you should have been back there. We were yeah. talking about this. So. <laughs> so we were talking back before we came out about the, um, one of the ways that you can grab girls, but also just a more broad population, is to link and show um, the benefits of engineering as a helping profession. So I like to say 98% of what we interact with in our world has been made by an engineer or touched by an engineer. And so you give me anything and I can tell you what engineer and sometimes scientist is behind it. And so if you draw out those explicit helping connections, people, animals, the society, the environment, um, you tend to draw in and make it really relevant. So context was another thing. I'll let someone fill Real in that setting the context. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, okay. Um, so um, we we actually um, uh, had an experience with this a little bit. So we um, every few months we launch a challenge where we um, uh, invite our community to participate in a challenge, like invent uh, invent something that moves or invent something that uh, pranks someone. And one of the challenges we launched uh, was invent for good. Uh, and we had kids participating. We had uh, by far the most entries in that challenge. Uh, and we had kids participate, uh, many of them creating something to help someone in their community or somebody underprivileged in some way. And some of the inventions were, uh, for example, assistive technology for a, a young girl created something for her grandfather who had um, a seeing impairment where there was a, a, an ultrasonic um, a sensor. And every time uh, he would come close to an obstacle, it would start buzzing and tell him that he had oh, wow. to move away. Uh, we had people create uh, light patterns for wheelchairs so that the wheelchairs could be more visible um, uh, when they're farther away. We had uh, all sorts of like little delivery mechanisms, all um, hundreds of entries. And I remember very well after seeing that, I uh, asked our, our, our head of community, um, it, does this look like there are more girls in this challenge than boys? Um, and we and we didn't do like a full-on study, but anecdotally, yes, it was overwhelmingly more girls than boys. And so um, we we saw these uh, girls inventing things that would really solve problems around sustainability, around assistive technology, around um, helping um, helping the less uh, you know fortunate. Um, 
incredible ideas, some of which don't exist in the world today. And so we've had a fantasy of like, what if we kind of explode this and make it bigger and try to find some way to fund them to make something bigger. So we haven't yet, but um, I think there's so much room to be able to, uh, to create partnerships with companies that are uh, in real kind of engineering and technology in the world and they're enabling and they have funding and these ideas that come from kids because it raises awareness, it empowers them, and also I really think it, it surfaces new ideas that maybe adults are not thinking about. Could, could I? Just look at Oh, Diamond, go. Oh, I did one thing to that. I think that just, you know, we're saying this, how girls and, and kids respond to real world challenges. Um, and I think that, that, that sometimes we find that surprising, but if we do, it's because we forget just how incredibly amazing kids are and the, how capable they are. It is a real ultimate act of respect to them to invite them to the conversation, and they deserve to be asked, how do you want to help solve climate change? How do you want to help solve the water problem? Because they're the kids, who, they, these are the people who are inheriting these problems and they feel respected, they feel included, and oh my gosh, you're right. Who knows what they will come up with? So, go kids. Mm -hmm. I think we have one more, last time for one more question. Oh, okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is Susan Garfield. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a, a mother of a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old girls. Um, I ha also happen to be a doctorate of public health, have been in the life sciences industry for 23 years. Um, kind of have always thought of myself as trying to push forward STEAM um, activities. And, but now I have this real life lab with this 13 and 10 year old girl. And, um, and so, so my question is, is this. First, first a plug. Um, we're involved in this incredible program called Destination Imagination. If anybody doesn't know about it, go look it up. It is the most amazing experiential education program for kids, um, fourth to 12th grades. They do six-month projects of activating science and art and learning um, through experience. So look it up, give to it, participate in it. OK, the question. Um, I noticed with, with my, my, my girls that even when they're engaged in math and science activities, um, my oldest through things like Russian math and science club and robotics, and my youngest through things like cooking, um, there, is, there is not necessarily a gender gap but almost an ethnic gap emerging um, in our schools. And so I, I, I'm saying this from the position of being a scientist, not a, a <laughs> I don't want you to take this as, a, as a, um, uh, a social commentary, but maybe it is. We as parents, uh, especially third, fourth, fifth generation, are parenting our kids differently than first generation parents. Um, there's a huge community of scientists coming into the Boston area with incredible knowledge and their kids are starting to go down different paths. And I'm wondering how we can embrace this infusion of innovation and thinking and also different styles of parenting so that we can engage our kids in math and science um, in, in a more meaningful way and bring that teaching into our school. So I just wanted to, to ask you the question, I don't think it's just gender, I think it's ethnic norms, cultural norms, as well as gender. So. And also for different communities who have different levels of exposure, not just people who are coming who have great high exposure, to your point, underserved communities. And I'm going to ask you to um, answer this fairly quickly because we're a little over time. Um, I think, you know, having a diversity of ways into a problem and recognizing that different people will bring different attributes and look to what they are bringing to the problem and how you build on their strengths is one thing that across the literature um, researchers are suggesting is a way to engage people from you know, points of strength, and then from there, when there's some trust built, you can move into areas that might be less familiar. Sort of recognizing the diversity is, I think, part of what makes science and engineering innovation flourish. And, and I would just say starting really, really, really young with books and media and having a wide, wide variety of representation of all kinds of people, from all kinds of backgrounds in that just to give kids the thought, oh, maybe that's a possibility, and the parents as well. So. Let's thank our panels. <laughs>